we adore you as God. We praise you for your love, that love that has made us your children. We are meant to learn more about your work in our continent in times past. So be with us. We adore you as God. Comment to you, our speaker, we pray you for your love, that love that has made us your children. May he be at his best in presenting we are meant to learn more about your work in our continent. For us participants, Give us attentive listening and learning ears. To you, Speaker, Minister, we pray you to the technical issues relevant to this meeting. And may your blessing fall on all our activities. We pray all this in Jesus' gracious name. Amen. 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 We will, we will continue as... Um, we invite uh, Dr. Gezi and then uh, Dr. Michael Glerup to do the um, welcome address and uh, updates on how things have been going uh, in the two um, centers. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walton. And thank you all for joining, making time to join us uh, for this fourth lecture in the series we started in 2021. Um, <clears throat> so this is a joint um, lecture with caption Walls Odin Media Collection in Early African Christianity, um, jointly organized by the Center for the Study of Early African uh, Christianity uh, here at the Akrofi Crystalline Institute and then the Center for Early African Christianity, New Haven um, in the US. And now basically is to honor the memory and life and work of three personalities whose research interests traversed um, this area of early African Christianity and its connection to modern African Christian experience. Andrew, uh, F. Walls, uh, 1928 to 2021. Um, and then Thomas C. Odin, 1931 to 2016. And um, Kwame Bediako, 1945 to 2008. And we've had um, three previous um, presenters, lecturers. Uh, Professor Andrew Walls himself was alive to give us the maiden lecture on the subject, Does Early African Christianity Matter Today? And this was in April 2021. And then in October that year, we had Dr. David Eastman uh, speaking to us on the theme, African Voices in Early Christian Debates About God. And then in April this year, we're privileged to have Dr. Salim Faraj uh, presenting on the theme, the African spiritual dimensions of medieval Nubian Christianity. So we are grateful to God that our previous lecturers have given us stimulating um, presentations to, to, to ponder on. And the idea is to have um, such scholars share with us their research interests that can um, give particularly students um, some areas to consider and also to encourage their interest in, in the area of early African um, Christianity. And as has been said, we're looking forward to have um, Professor David Wilhite on early African Christianity rewritten from right to left. At this point, I will invite Michael, uh, my colleague, Dr. Glerup, if you have any updates for us. Yes, so thank you, Rudolph, uh, for the introduction of the series. It is, as you know, many of you know, today was Tom Oden would have been 91 years old. Right. And so right. in, in the in the ancient church, his birthday might have been celebrated the day he died, but 
in you know the, the our times now we we talk about your birthday is the day you're born so <laughs> the, the, when you die it's your birth into heaven for the early african church so i do would like to recognize um fellow ceac fellows with rudolph chris hall joel lasky and david wilhite so uh, they're all part of our our work at the center for early african christianity and i should I take, should I introduce David now? Okay, so, um, so David Wilhite is the professor. Yes, yes, you may, you may. Okay. David Wilhite is a professor of Christian theology at George W. Truett Theological Seminary at Baylor University. He came to Truett in the fall of 2007. He has written four books, over 30 articles and essays, and he's helped edit numerous research projects. His primary work has been on ancient African Christianity and more generally in the development of early Christian theology. He's currently co-authoring a three-volume work on early Christology, focusing on how early Christians, oh, let me pull this back up, how early Christians understood Jesus' pre-existence and how he was the one appearing in the scriptures as were Lord. His book, Ancient African Christianity, an introduction to a unique context and tradition published by Routledge in 2017, was well-reviewed in academic circles. So I'm really actually quite pleased that he, he is speaking today. Um, so without any more um, delay, let's ask David to speak. Yeah, David. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for having me here and thank you for that introduction. And I do wanna say thanks to uh, all the work that's being done at these different centers. I admire the work greatly and uh, just appreciative of all that uh, is being done among all of you. Uh, and I also wanna honor the, the men after whom this lecture is named. I never had the opportunity to meet Andrew Walls, but of course knew of his work and appreciated it. And when I was a grad student at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, a couple of times I had the chance to go down to Edinburgh and go to the Andrew Walls, uh, the, the center he founded, the Center for the Study of, Earl, of World Christianity. Um, and while there, I discovered books like the book entitled Theology and Identity, The Impact of Culture Upon Christian Thought in the Second Century and in Modern Africa, and therefore discovered Kwame Bidiako. Um, and was uh, used him a lot in my dissertation, a book that was later uh, published as entitled Tertullian the African. So again, never had the opportunity to meet uh, Professor Bidiaco, but uh, really want to honor him and say my appreciation for the work he did. And then I did get the chance to meet Thomas Oden once and corresponded with him and spoke with him on the phone on another occasion. And uh, again, had, had already known of his work in the wider sort of world of theology and Christian history. Um, and then was very glad to see his book come out on how Africa shaped the Christian mind. Uh, and got a chance to meet him at a conference, very nervous about sort of, sort of my first attempt to dip my toe into that water. And he found him just to be incredibly encouraging and positive. And I really uh, appreciated the very small role he had personally in my life, but the very big role he played in his, in his work. So again, thank you all for having me here. Uh, I am going to talk on the subject as it was introduced. And to do so, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now and share with you PowerPoint uh, presentation for today. So I trust you all can see that. So my title, as it was introduced, is Early African Christianity Rewritten from Right to Left. And I'll explain that subtitle in just a moment. When I speak of North Africa, I'm primarily talking about Africa uh, north of the Sahara and primarily west of Egypt, although, of course, the subject matter we're addressing applies to Egypt and Ethiopia as well, but most of my research has been in the Latin writers, uh, and those are all coming from what the Romans called Africa Proconsularis, which is marked here on this map. That was a Roman province once Rome conquered this region. But Rome would also refer to the whole continent as Africa. They thought it was named after the Afri people, so Africa is the place of the Africans. And they would include Egypt in it in its most general usage, and Ethiopia as well, but they often um, tended to use Africa in a way that 
excluded Egypt. Egypt was sort of such a unique context. They thought of Egypt as already a pre-existing country and then as a separate province. So sometimes it was included as part of Africa, sometimes it wasn't. You also see at the bottom of this map the word Libya. The Greek writers tended to use the word Libya in the same way the Roman writers used the word Africa. It tends to mean the region west of Egypt, but sometimes it can refer to the whole continent. So that'll be one of our questions today is the relationship of this northern region and Roman Empire to the wider continent. Uh, this is the remains of the amphitheater in Carthage. It's the place where you would have seen the gladiator shows and prisoners would have been fed to the beasts and the criminals would have included Christians, namely Perpetua, Felicity and other North African Christians. You can go there today and see the ruins of it. These would have been the, the, the underground passages that uh, Perpetua and her fellow martyrs would have walked through. Here's another one from North Africa that's still in modern day Tunisia. It's been partly rebuilt, but you can see sort of the, the remnants there um, displaying the power of Rome in this region. And when you go throughout North Africa, it's clearly very Romanized, but there's also a Christian presence there. And you can go see remains of ancient basilica and church uh, sites that are still there today. Now, you all may know that Tertullian is has a famous line where he asked about the relationship of philosophy to Christianity. I would say it's a misunderstood line too often, but I'll, that's a lecture for another day. He asked, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Now, keep in mind, when he's asking this question, he's not looking at the map we're looking at. He can't see much beyond sub-Saharan Africa, but he does think of the whole landmass of Africa when he's writing from Africa. But in his world, the best cartographers and thinkers believe that the world was one large landmass made up of three continents, Europe, Libya or Africa and Asia. And for Tertullian to ask this question, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? He's not asking this question from the perspective of Athens or Jerusalem. He is writing from the perspective of the other continent. And he's looking to these two other places with something specific in mind about their relationship but their relationship for his audience in Africa. So to return to that question, today's audience, many are wondering what uh, ancient African Christianity has to do with the wider African continent. So we could um, borrow Tertullian's phrasing here and reword this to say, not what has Athens to do with Jerusalem, but what has Alexandria to do with Johannesburg? Or what does early North African Christianity have to do with the wider African continent. Now, this is a very large question, and I'm going to have to say I'm asking a much smaller subset of this question today. Lots of people, even people that were part of the work of in this group here, are addressing this question. I don't claim to know the best way to answer this question, but I know that we should be answering this question. Uh, to start with, most average Christians, I would say, at least the average Christians that I encounter in my context don't recognize that Christianity ever was in Africa. Or if they do, they have a very cloudy, unclear picture of what that looked like. But North Africa was very heavily Christianized. And just to give one quick illustration before we move on, if you were to just take one small part of this North African region that I mentioned, so this is uh, in the bottom, I've circled, I've put a box around one of the main provinces, and there has been a study of martyr shrines in this region. And it's hard to see all those little dots at the top along that map. But if you were to go along, not just the coastline, but hundreds of miles into the coastline, I've highlighted them in red here. These are all the known martyr sites from this one part of North Africa. And I mean, there are literally hundreds of them that are known. And we know from literature, there would have been more that didn't survive. And so to think of Christianity in Africa, we need to think of this as a very heavily Christianized region. So if you go there today, you can visit ancient Christian sites, as I said, and it's very easy to try to think of Christianity as simply emerging in that period of the Roman Empire and being very Roman. And in a way that is true because a lot of these this remains look very Roman, the literature is in Latin, but I think there's more to the picture. And of course, uh, someone who's really brought a lot of attention to this we've already mentioned is Tom Oden. I call some of his last books a travelogue because he got to go back to North Africa and visit some of these sites. 
you're all aware of the Center for Early African Christianity, where I'm a fellow. I just put this on here to give credit to them because I, I'm indebted to a lot of the work that they've done in particular. But Tom Oden that founded that center has this book that I've already mentioned, How Africa Shaped the Early Christian Mind. And it has a great, I think, way of starting this conversation. Let's look again at North Africa and recognize these were not just Romans, they're not just Latin speakers, they're Africans that shaped Northern European and the wider Christian world. So here are other books of his, of course, that you're likely familiar with, where he's trying to further address this question. So if I come back to this question and point to people like Tom Oden, Andrew Walls, Kwame Bidiako, people who have already done much to try to answer this, I have the luxury of answering a much smaller question, but let me get to that by introducing something in particular here. There is a uh, famous book from a French Algerian writer, Albert Camus, called The Stranger. Many of you probably are familiar with this. It's a very short book. It's supposed to be a champion of nihilism. And the reason that's thought to be the case is because the main character there, Merceau, is walking along the beach one day in North Africa, in Algeria. He's a French Algerian. And he comes across an Arab Algerian and he murders him. And the entire book is this monologue given by this main character as to why he did it. And there's no good reason why he did it. It was just for nothing. It was nihilistic. And for decades, people have been debating the you know, post-structural uh, French philosophical influence on Albert Camus. However, just a few years ago, there was another book that came out that revisited this story by Cam uh, Camille Daoud, The Merceau Investigation. And this time, the story is told all over again, the exact same scene, the exact same story, but it's told now not from the perspective of the French Algerian who murdered the man, but from the perspective of the Arab Algerian man who was murdered, it's told by the, his brother. And the entire book is where the brother simply agonizes not only of the loss of his brother, why was he murdered, but he agonizes over the fact that his brother was never even named in the entire book by Camus. Merceau, who tells the story in the first book, never bothers to name his victim and in the Merceau investigation, as told from his brother's perspective, the question is, why couldn't you at least do them the honor of giving him a name? And so the character there says that this story needs to be retold. It's simple, he says. The story we're talking about should be rewritten in the same language, but from right to left. You may know that Arabic is much like Hebrew. It's not written like many of our European languages from left to right. It's written from right to left. So. This story is going to be retold from the perspective of the Algerian, from the Arab Algerian. And if, even if it's written in the same language, it's going to be told from the perspective of right to left. Well, I think that's what needs to be done in North African Christian history. We need, have told this story too long from the perspective of Western European historians. And of course, we tell it from left to right. But as I'll try to demonstrate, there is much to make us think that the story needs to be retold from right to left. Now, one problem I need to confess uh, up front, if you can't tell, I am incapable of offering what would be called an Afrocentric reading of ancient African Christianity. Therefore, I can't come in and do something like what Merceau was uh, needed to do and what Kamel Daoud is calling for. I'm saying that needs to be done the best I can do is offer something like what Tom Oden started. I can offer a travel diary of North African Christian history. There is a few different terms that were used in the ancient world to describe these. If you were going on a sea voyage, you would write a periplus. And it just so happens the oldest known periplus uh, account of, of, of the voyage and of what you would see is actually written by a North African. Uh, if you were doing a land journey, it would uh, be a periagasis or an itinerarium. So you would write your itinerary, but what you would do in this travel diary is tell all the things you see. But in all of these sort of diaries, what happens is you tell the things that stand out to you because you are actually the foreigner in this visit. As you're traveling, you talk about the things that, that are unique, that are different than what you would see in your homeland. And I think that we could do the same if we were talking about North African Christianity. For example, if you were to pick up a history book on ancient Syriac Christianity, or even Christianity in Egypt or Ethiopia, it's very common that this is the way it's normally written. 
you focus on the Syriac language or in Egypt, the Coptic language. You focus on Syriac culture, on unique expressions to Syriac or Egyptian Christianity. And that's natural because of all the sources being in different languages and you're looking for these different cultural experiences. Unfortunately, this has not been done with North African Christianity. And I think this is in large part due to the simple fact that we have our literary sources all survive in Latin. So it's very easy to say, well, these aren't really Africans, they're Romans. And they were Roman citizens. And then it's very easy to say these Latin speakers who were Romans are part of Western Christianity and they're not really part of indigenous African experience. And I would just say that that is a, a, a mistake from the beginning. There's a faulty assumption there. Even though these sources are written in Latin, we can find traces of their unique African identity and culture and expression. So if you were to look at some of the famous writers like Tertullian, Cyprian, Augustine, most people know at least these names. They are all very influential for all of Christianity and they're all African. And as I will try to show, they have an African identity. But there are many other names that are not so well known. This is just a quick list I compiled to try to point to some of the other sources that are available. But again, when people look at these names, you see that these are largely Latin names. They have that Latin ending on almost all of them, and it's just easy to dismiss them as not really African, whatever that means, and instead to think of them as simply Roman. But I want to show that uh, sometimes these are Roman names, but that shouldn't fool us. So, for example, here's a little known author, Paulus. Uh, this is not the Apostle Paul from the New Testament. This is a different writer, probably named after the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul from the New Testament is a really good case study here because the Apostle Paul, let's remember, is a Roman citizen. And the Apostle Paul writes in Greek. But we also know that the Apostle Paul is a Hebrew of Hebrews. So why can't it that this Paul in North Africa, who writes in Latin and who is a Roman citizen, why can't we also assume he's an African of African? In fact, I would say there's good reasons to assume that based on some of the things he says in his works. Another example would be this name down here, Quodul Deus. This uh, has that word in it, Deus, at the end. That's the Latin word for God. And Latin names rarely have what's called theophoric names. Uh, they don't have the word God or names of God in their names. Greek tends to have a lot of this. Most Mediterranean uh, languages and uh, cultures have this. So in the book of Acts, Theophilus is, is who the book is dedicated to. Most, most people who study Acts learn that Theophilus is a name that means beloved of God. Well, that's common in Greek and other languages. It's not common in Latin. So when you come across this man, Quodul Deus, he's writing just after the time of Augustine from Carthage. It's clear that this is not a Roman name. This is a Latinized name. Whatever his name was, it's been, as it were, translated into Latin. This name means what God wills or what God wants. This is very likely a Punic or Phoenician name, an African name that's simply been translated. Augustine has a similar uh, case when he names his son Adiodatus. Adiodatus, again, has that word Deo in it, from God. It, his name means a gift from God, which again is unusual for Latin names. So why does Augustine name his son this? Well, there's one theory. That points to the Phoenician or Punic background of Tertullian, uh, sorry, of Augustine and his family. And Monica, his mother, is definitely thought to be a, uh, it's, she's often called a Berber or a Libyan. And if you look at the Phoenician name that would be translated this way, the name Hannibal, the famous general of the Carthage, Carthaginian Empire, he was the one who went to war with Rome during the Punic Wars. His name, it's a cognate of, of Hebrew, actually, in Phoenician, Hana means grace or gift, and Baal means Lord. And so this, for Augustine, is very likely a way of putting into Latin, a Latin-sounding name, the name that Augustine's son's mother gave him, which was Hannibal. So what does it mean for Augustine's son to need, be named Hannibal after the famous Carthaginian general? And what does it mean that he would translate this into Latin? This is something I'm going to briefly explore today. One last example of names, though, is uh, Lactantius. Lactantius is a very famous writer around the time of Constantine. He's been called the, uh, the Christian Cicero. He's a gifted Latin speaker and writer, but he's also African. 
And we know this from many of the materials he, he that has survived from his writings. And his name is a perplexing one because this cannot be a Latin name. Lactantius in Latin would mean one who lactates. And we are certain that Lactantius is not named this because he lactates. He does not milk or nurse any children. Lactantius must be from the root word of a Punic word that has simply been not translated, but simply Latinized in its sound. So again, I just want to say from the beginning, when we look at these names and the list of African writers, they are Africans, even if they have Roman names. And if we just dig below the surface, we might be able to read from right to left. Augustine found a letter written by another African who had been very heavily Romanized. And I'll read you the quote because Augustine found that this man was making fun of Christians who had Punic names. So Augustine says, as an African man writing to Africans, and even as one abiding in Africa, you could not have forgotten yourself and thought of Punic names as flawed. There are Punic books produced by very educated men. For this land is the still warm cradle of the Punic language itself. You disrespect and snub Punic names to such an extent is as if you had surrendered to the Roman altars. So you see there Augustine can defend what he calls African names or what we would say Punic names from those Carthaginian uh, background before Roman times. And I'll talk a little bit about that, what it means to be Punic coming up. So I'm gonna give three areas that I think we can, if we were to write a travelogue, these are areas we would see unique African features uh, in North African Christian history, and really in Christian history, but in wider African Christian history as well. I'm afraid this is a very grainy photo. It was taken when I was there in 2011, but it's from a mosaic found in Southern Tunisia. So part of North Africa, this was in a house and there are characters all around this one character in the middle. This with all of her weapons of war is Roma, the spirit of Rome herself. And she's holding in her hand, as it were, the orb of the world. And so you see, if I go back to this other image, there is Rome, the center of the universe, and surrounding her are other women characters. I'll show you a couple of these. Here is Egypta. She's got her Isis rattle, particular Egyptian clothes, particular Egyptian hairstyle, much has been made of her as the symbol of Egypt. And then the next one is one you might could guess if you figured out what's on her head, this is actually a mask that has been pulled back onto her head to reveal her face. So if you can see, there's the tusks standing up and the trunk that if we're pulled down forward, you would see is the uh, elephant face mask. But she's pulled it back to reveal her face because this is the spirit of Afra, Afra herself, Africa. And in this image, Africa is one of the many people who are surrounding Rome. But if you go to another part of the same house, there's another image here. And this time she's the only one in the mosaic. And if I zoom in a little closer here, you can see that this is meant to be the same character. It's the same head mask, except it doesn't have the, the tusks of the elephant. And I'm, I'm not sure what the significance of that is, but it's been pulled back to reveal her face. And much has been made of her appearance, of her hairstyle, of her features as an African. But even more than that to me is that's interesting is what does it mean that this house has in one mosaic and uh, a public display of allegiance to Rome as the center of power? And then in another instance, it can display the spirit of Afra herself standing alone. It seems to me there's something important about this homeowner's connection to Africa and probably to an African identity. Now, if you were to go to other non-Christian sources, uh, these are some of the writers from North Africa that are not Christians, uh, some before Christian times. And every one of them are famous for writing in Latin, for being heavily Romanized, but also for keeping their allegiances and their patronage in Africa. And they speak of themselves as Africans. Now I'm gonna compare these to some Christian writers in just a moment, but let me start with the non-Christian writers. Fronto is a famous Senator, but he's from North Africa. And one time he exclaims this proudly and says, I am a Libyan of the nomad Libyans. 
I, it, to me, this is incredible because it's an almost perfect parallel to what I said about Paul earlier. Paul is a Roman citizen, and yet he can also be a Hebrew of Hebrews. So Fronto can be a Roman senator and be a Libyan of Libyans. Another non-Christian writer is Apollias. Apollias is put on trial, and he wins the trial because he's such a gifted speaker and writer. And in his Latin speech, uh, the, it's recorded that his opponent accused him of being a barbarian from Africa. But instead of denying this, Apollias proudly admits this. And he says, what's wrong with being a barbarian from Africa? I proudly proclaim, proclaim myself not only to be African, but to be, in his own words, he would call this a mixture, a half, he would use something like, that would sound to us like a racial slur, a half breed. He says, I am half Numidian and half Gaetulian. These are two African tribes in North Africa. By the way, Augustine knows of Apollias and he mentions him by name in one text, he says, Apollias, of whom I choose rather to speak, because as our own countryman, he is better known to us Africans. There's a martyrdom that comes from the year 303. It's little known. It's not even been translated into English in a published version. And in fact, I need to uh, here just give credit to a friend of mine who sadly passed away this last year. David Riggs has worked on this martyrdom. Uh, and he tragically died. He was a professor of theology at Indiana Wesleyan University, and he shared some of his translation with me. So I'm, I'm indebted to, the, to him on, this, on studying this text. Um, but in this text, a group of Christians have been arrested. And the proconsul says to the Christians, where have you come from? Now, by the way, this is set in North Africa, and they are clearly North Africans. He, he acknowledges that. But when he asks where you come from, Galonius, the Christian leader, says, from the city of Nazareth. And the proconsul is puzzled. He says, where is Nazareth? In what region? Galonius responded, in the east. But it doesn't stop there because here is where the proconsul says, but you who are African, how can you know Nazareth? And they responded, every Christian is a Nazarene. But now the proconsul asks the more precise question, where were you born? And they answer, oh, in Sabratha, in Libya. So, yes, if you were to read most of these Christian martyrdoms, the Christians are going to identify, first and foremost, as Christians. Christianus sum, I am a Christian. And they're writing in Latin, but that does not deny the fact that they are also from North Africa and can identify as Africans. So I think you'll find a lot of references to their own African identity in the sources. You can also find what I mentioned earlier, reference to Punic culture. And I'll move pretty swiftly through this, but Punic is simply the Latin form of saying Phoenician. So in our Old Testament, when we think of all the Phoenicians, the Phoenicians conquered much of North Africa and spread their trade throughout there. And then for almost a thousand years before the time of Christianity had so enmeshed themselves and blended into North African culture. They're one of the dominant language groups uh, and people groups in North Africa. So Maureen Tilly has pointed out, and she's another one who tragically died too soon a few years ago from cancer, but she has done a much to study this region. And she points out that Christianity in this region is marked by Punic culture. So I mentioned a while ago Hannibal. He's the famous general who led uh, the fight against Rome. He marched his, his elephants and his armies over the Swiss Alps and attacked Rome. This is, of course, a Renaissance a European depiction of him as an Arab. But Hannibal was not an Arab. We're not exactly sure what he looks like because most of the busts and coins of Hannibal come from Rome. But we do have a, a clear idea of North Africans having a disdain for Rome. And the Afri Carthaginian, uh, the Punic Wars was remembered by Carthaginians in North Africa long after Hannibal. Tertullian will constantly reference uh, Hannibal. As I said, Augustine's son may be named after Hannibal. What does that mean for their African identity? even though they're Christians. The Punic language survives throughout the Roman Empire, uh, the imperial period, all the way through Christian times, all the way until uh, the time of the spread of Islam into North Africa. So here is a Roman name inscribed on the stone at the bottom, Lupercus, but above it is Punic language. Augustine will use Punic language to help explain his, uh, some of his sermons. He will talk about Hebrew words, and since Hebrew is a cognate of Phoenician or Punic, he will often tell his audience, you know this word, because in Punic, this word is, and then he'll explain more about the Old Testament. Uh, Augustine also laments in one of his letters that he cannot find enough Punic speakers on his side. There, there's, a, there's a schism in his day between the Donatists and his so-called Catholic party. 
And he could not find enough Catholic priests who speak Punic. And all the Donatist priests can. And Augustine's concerned about ministering to the local people who speak the Punic language. Uh, to speak again about a non-Christian, the first ever African emperor, uh, Septimius Severus, we're told that when he gets to Rome, people made fun of his accent because even though he had a melodious voice, it sounded like an African somehow right up to his old age. Augustine will also talk about how his mother and his dialogues, what's called the Cassiciacum Dialogues with his son, Adeodatus, and some of his other friends. When he first moves back to Africa, he begins to record these dialogues and his mother comes in and they talk about how she speaks Latin, but with an accent. And it's clearly with an African accent. And yet they still honor Monica because she has as much wisdom as all of them. Another element that you find in North Africa generally is the remnants of Punic gods. And at first when archeologists went to North Africa, Western archeologists went to North Africa, they would find many shrines to Saturn and the inscription said Saturn, Saturnus in Latin. And so they assumed these were Roman gods. But the more they studied them, they realized that these are simply Roman names for North African Punic gods. And again, there's much that I could just go on to give examples of that. But suffice it to say that when Tertullian, Lactantius, Augustine talk about God as the most high God, there are many scholars who have found connections to the way that local Africans were speaking of their most high God even before Christianity. Another example is Septimia Severus, who when he becomes, I mentioned him a while ago, the, the emperor, when he becomes an emperor, now he, he is what we would call a, uh, a, they would, they would call, I should say, a pagan or an idolater, a non-Christian, and he stamps on his coins this phrase, the gods of the homeland, the patrii. The question is, which gods are these? And Septimius Severus has very cleverly portrayed these gods the way that many in North Africa had to do with their deities and with the rest of their Punic identity and culture. If you looked at this, these gods from the homeland of Septimius Severus, he's from Leptis Magna in what is today uh, Libya. From North Africa, these look like Libyan or Punic gods, Shedrapa and Melkart. But if you're in Rome, these look like the gods of your homeland, Liber Pater and Hercules. So Christians also will be able to translate in these ways. They'll be able to use their own heritage to explain the things that they're embracing in Christianity. Um, Dido is the famous founder of Carthage. She founded it sometime around the year 800 BC. And as queen of Carthage, she's always remembered and heralded as a hero. In fact, Augustine tells us that when he learned the story of Dido as a schoolboy, that he wept. Now, the reason he weeps is Dido has a tragic ending. And the only version known to most readers is Dido's story in Virgil's Aeneid. Remember, Virgil's the Roman writer who's championing Caesar Augustus. And in that version, uh, Virgil tells that when Aeneas was fleeing the burning city of Troy and his gods had sent him to establish the city of Rome, he stopped at the port of Carthage. And while there, he fell in love with the beautiful Queen Dido of Africa. And yet the gods insisted that he leave Africa and go establish Rome. And Virgil tells us that when this happened, Dido was so distraught at being jilted that she committed suicide. Now, Tertullian actually tells us a very different version of this story. And I should warn you, this is shocking and horrible content. But in Tertullian's version, Dido does not commit suicide because she is saddened that Aeneas left. Instead, according to Tertullian, the African Christian writer, Dido committed suicide because Aeneas was trying to assault and rape her. And so she committed suicide in order to pr protect her chastity over being raped by this new founder of Rome. So when Augustine says he wept over Dido as a schoolboy, which version of the story was he weeping over? Another element in Punic heritage that you find in these sources is the elephant. I've mentioned that a couple of times already. The elephant for Roman writers is always the symbol of Africa. I think even for African writers, they thought of themselves as the place where there are elephants. And this actually shows up in one interesting text. Uh, sorry, here's another coin of, uh, uh, with an e elephant coined by Carthaginians. But I go back to that writer I mentioned earlier, Lactantius, that, that name that can't be a Roman name. He's writing to a Christian who had been persecuted 
and was they thought was going to be martyred, but he survived the persecution and was set free. And in this work, Lactantius says, how pleasing was that spectacle to God when he beheld you, the Christian who'd been persecuted, as victor, not bringing under subjection to your chariot white horses or huge elephants, but best of all, the very triumphant ones themselves. Now, let's stop and ask, why is Lactantius talking about a triumph with a chariot pulled by white horses or huge elephants? Well, you may remember that in any Roman triumph, the general who led the army and defeated a foreign army was given this triumph, this parade through the city of Rome. It was a, it was a huge honor. And it was the only time someone was allowed in Rome to wear a crown on their head, and they were to stand on a chariot pulled by four white horses. And as they go through the streets of Rome, all the people come out in the streets and wave palm branches and cheer them on as a hero who defeated, again, I say this, a foreign army. But here, Lactantius mentions white horses and elephants. And there's only one time anyone ever tried to have a triumph with elephants, and that was the general Pompey. Pompey was before the time of Julius Caesar, and he had actually been given permission by the Senate to go and fight a war, you guessed it, in Africa. And after defeating this African army, he comes back and insists that the Senate let him have a triumph. But he doesn't want a triumph like all the other Roman generals had had to date. He wants this to be the biggest and the best triumph and the most honorable moment ever. And so instead of hitching his chariot to four white horses, he decides to attach his chariot to elephants. And he is going to march through the city of Rome and show off the fact that he defeated this African army. But there was one thing that the general Pompey miscalculated. He did not realize it until he got to the city gates, but these elephants would not fit through the gates of Rome. And so Pompey, since there was no time to change this and the entourage in front and after was already in line, he simply had to dismount from his chariot and walk through the streets of Rome in shame with people mocking him, not even getting to ride in a chariot pulled by white horses, much less by huge elephants. Now here, in this text, Lactantius is speaking to an African Christian who has just been persecuted by Romans. And he says that your triumph will include a chariot pulled not by horses nor by elephants, but by the Roman persecutors themselves. Now, I would also just like to point out, if you read Lactantius in any edition or in any translation, you will not find a footnote referencing this story of Pompey and his failed triumph with the elephants. I cannot find any commentary that talks about it. I cannot find any study of Lactantius that references this very African scene. And I think that's because too often we are reading from left to right. We're reading from a Eurocentric perspective that's not interested in these kinds of uh, symbols and content that's important to Africans themselves. All right, so that covers it now for the Punic heritage. I just wanna say that Punic is only one of the many ethnic groups and language groups in North Africa. North Africa, like all of Africa, is not a monolith. And really there needs to be a full study done on what what's in the past been called the Berber or the Libyan, other native groups in North Africa. We know these were heavily Christianized. Uh, there are people who've tried to scratch the surface on this, but I just want to say that much more work needs to be done. Since most of the writings come from Carthage, the Punic elements are the most pronounced, but more I'm sure can be found. All right, last point that I'll, will move me to my conclusion is uh, the African doctrine that you can find here. And I just want to say that there are studies that have been able to trace unique features of North African Christian writers. I would especially recommend this uh, recent book to you. It's by Patu Burns and Robin Jensen, and they collaborated with many other scholars to trace different practices in North Africa. And they trace them from the earliest times with Tertullian all the way through Augustine and beyond. And they are able to show the unique features. How was baptism different in North Africa than in places like Italy? How was sacraments? How was preaching different? They have wonderful chapters on all of that. So I'll just simply point you to that work. And I just wanna say that there is a pattern. Tertullian writing around the year 200 has a conflict with someone he calls the Bishop of Bishops. 
And there's some debate on this, but the majority of scholars have said this must be the Bishop of Rome. And I'm convinced there's enough evidence that this is the Bishop of Rome he's talking about. And Tertullian is adamantly opposed to the way the Bishop of Rome is teaching. Later, Cyprian is the Bishop of Carthage. And Cyprian is the one who uh, we're told that every morning would wake up and say, hand me the master. And he would read Tertullian. So indebted to Tertullian, Cyprian also has a conflict with Stephen, who is the Bishop of Rome. And Stephen gathers together a council about how to handle a specific question about rebaptism. And the Italian bishops decide one way. Cyprian hosts a conference, uh, a council of bishops in North Africa. The African bishops decide another way. And Cyprian uh, staunchly defends the African decision, pointing to Tertullian in their own African tradition. The same will happen later with Augustine, you know, writing uh, in the late 300s, early 400s. Augustine is constantly referencing Cyprian and battling to claim to be the true heir to Cyprian. And in many of his writings, he comes into conflict with uh, groups like the Pelagians. Now, Pelagius himself is not from Italy, but many of the Italians defend Pelagius. And they will actually call Augustine names like they'll call him uh, Hannibal. They'll call him the, uh, the Punic writer. They will talk about his African views as only held because he's an African. And Augustine writes back and says, what's wrong with being African? Cyprian held to these views. I hold to these views. He defends this African tradition. So I think if you were to look through ancient African Christian history, you would see African identity, Punic culture, African doctrine. And there are many who have begun doing this. Uh, I'll be happy to email some of these resources to anyone who's uh, interested. Many of you will know some of these resources on here. I simply want to say that not only are there resources out there for further study, but there is much need for further study. I said at the beginning that I can't offer a reading that takes us from right to left. I can only offer something like a travelogue. I'm an outsider coming to see what did this place look like to someone like me. And I can look for unique African features and unique African contributions, but we still need help and uh, additional scholarship coming back to these early North African Christian sources to see how to, they would look if you were looking at them from right to left. All right, with that, I will stop my presentation. Well, thank you very, very, very much. Um, that's quite enlightening. Uh, we want to open the floor now for questions and um, interactions and so on, contributions. So if um, you have any of those, those of us participating, feel free to um, just come in and ask your question. Yeah, Perhaps I should start. Well, <laughs> Prof. Prof. Wellington, can you just hold on a minute? Um, Prof. Wilhite, you you've made the point that many of the ancient um, writers um, who were domiciled in North Africa presented themselves as African. The, the images that you, you used, the images of the, the, the spirits and so on, I noticed that the noses were pointed as against, you know, Sub-Saharan Africans with noses are broader and so on. Now, Dr. Gezi has his um, video on, you can, you can identify his, his nose as broad. Yours is pointed. You can, can, can you comment, comment on that? I can I can say something on that. If you um, let's see, how about if I share my screen again and go back to the one okay. image in particular? Um, okay, here it is. So this this image is one that's particularly attracted a lot of scholarship on. But um, I, I'm hesitant and reluctant to, to claim to know how to talk about physical features. But if you read scholars on this, they would point to here, Afra's features are actually very, uh, more African than the others in that other mosaic. So she does have dreadlocks. She does have a broad nose. She has thicker lips. Skin tone is always really difficult to map onto ancient images. You may know that uh, Athenian Greek images would all, all men were black and all women were white in ancient Greece. I mean, so the, 
the the skin tone is the I think the most difficult thing to find depicted, although you can find people talking about it. So I would just say that I'm really not the expert to ask about those kinds of features. I don't think that North Africa was white, but I'm not sure how to tie the, you know, the, the somatic characteristics of the rest of Africa to the, the, the writers that we have. I just don't know that if there is enough evidence and I'm certain if there, the evidence that is does survive, I'm probably not the best person to interpret that evidence. Okay, thank you, thank you, Prof. Yeah, um, Prof. Wellington, you wanted to ask a question. Thank you, Rudolf. Uh, I like to express my gratitude for the opportunity to listen to uh, Professor, Professor David Wilhite. Uh, hearing what he has said reminds me of some of the things I heard Professor Wall saying. Uh, at this last uh, lecture, which I listened to. Uh, I am not a theologian, nor am I an Africanist. I am a cultural heritage scholar uh, and a believing Christian. And I have followed the scriptures uh, to a large extent, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, looking for the African presence. And there's so much African presence in the scriptures. And uh, knowing this inspired me to write uh, a novel. I will come back to that later on. But let me comment on the observations I made. I was very glad that Professor uh, Will Hyde made reference to names, names of Africans, but we sounded uh, Latin or Greek. It's very common. I mean, as I speak now, my name standing there is Henry Wellington, but I don't have a streak of European in me. It was a name which was given to me by my parents, borrowed from an uncle, and then the name Wellington came to me uh, as a heritage from my grandfather who had worked with an European called Wellington in Ghana. Yeah, so it's a common thing that uh, at times, you know, human beings decide to use foreign names to identify themselves. And that was what I think Professor Will, uh, Will Hyde, uh, identified, uh, you know, in his lecture. I'm very glad that to, for that. He also made reference to the uh, various uh, cultural practices from the, uh, you know, the people of North Africa at that time. So he made reference to the Punic culture the Punic language, the Punic uh, heritage. All these things for me uh, reinforce my thinking about the African presence in North Africa. Now, what I'm driving at is to find out from uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Wilhite about the Asian name of Africans, as you make reference to the fact that the uh, Africans uh, were named as Afro, uh, which was by the Greeks. And in my research, I realized that there's a name, an Asian name given to the Africans by themselves, not by the Latins, not by the Romans, nor by the Greeks, but by themselves. And that is known as Ake Bulan. This had inspired my mind to uh, give a title to the novel, which I've written. So I wanted to find out from uh, Professor Wilhite whether in his research, he had come across this ancient name of Africa as uh, Ake Bulan. Now, my uh, next point is a request. In fact, I came, I was desperate to come on this uh, uh, Zoom because I want to have a personal contact with uh, Professor Wilhite and ask him if you would mind to review the novel which I've written titled Ake Bulan Duo. The duo uh, has to do with the two Africans. I didn't create them, but which I discovered. Uh, Simon Osarini was an African based on the facts. And since the Bible does not give any detailed reference of the background of uh, Barabbas, I made him to be a person of an African descent. And the two of them, uh, Barabbas and Sa Simon Sarini, 
related very closely to the story of the crucifixion. And that brought them together, which had inspired me to write this novel, tracing their activities after they have met uh, the dying Christ and the resurrected Christ, to move from Judea to Azotus, to Pelusium, to Sarini, in search of a route to go and meet the Ethiopian Enoch to help him uh, propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ because they have met this Jesus personally in uh, Jerusalem. Now, so I was going to ask Professor Wilhite whether he would be ready to review my book, my novel, which will be published in December. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you, Prof. Wellington. Uh, Prof. Uh, Wilhite, um, your, your comments on um, his, yes. His, 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 yeah. Yes, thank you, Professor Wellington. I uh, I did not know of this name, so I'd be I'd be uh, happy to learn more about it and the source for it and where you learned it from. Uh, perhaps you can send that information to me when you send me your book. Yes, I would be uh, honored to re to read it and review it. Um, so I look forward to seeing that when it is out. Uh, the idea of Simon of Cyrene being African, uh, many on here will know that Thomas Oden wrote a book on this, on the African memory of Mark, and he has a chapter where he really focuses on all the evidence that connects Simon in particular, but other names in Mark, and of course Mark himself, to, to Egypt and to uh, Cyrenaica, and to that part of North Africa. I would just only add, as a, I wish I had more time in this talk to give more evidence of how these sorts of things show up, because one of the ways you really can see the sort of African identity coming out in North African writers is when they read scripture, passages like the Simon, the Cyrene carrying the cross. Uh, I mentioned Augustine's uh, schism with the Donatists. The Donatists have uh, many texts that survive. And in uh, some of them, they talk about how um, words like South, whenever the word South shows up in the Bible, they think that's a reference to, to Africa in particular. And in particular, when Simon the Cyrene is made to carry the cross, there's one Donatist who comments that says, of course, Simon had to carry the cross because Simon was an African and Africans have always been made to bear the cross because he's alluding to the fact that all of those martyr shrines I pointed to, the martyrs of North Africa are, are, are so common that the Africans call themselves the Church of the Martyrs. So thank you. I appreciate the, the, that insight and those comments and look forward to your book. Well, thank you, Prof. Wilhite. Um, are there any other uh, questions? Um, yes. Okay. If, uh, if I may. Yes, send me on. <laughs> can, you, can you introduce, can you pronounce your name for us? Yes. Are you in uh, Ethiopia? My, sorry? Are you in Ethiopia? No, no. Okay, well, can, in... can you introduce yourself and tell us where you're from? Yes. I'm, uh, I'm Segbeyon, Mathieu Nyohosu. Mathieu doesn't appear, but Mathieu is another option. And I am from the Republic of Benin. Uh, currently, okay. I am in Seattle, Washington. Okay. All uh, right. I, I teach at uh, Seattle Pacific University here. Okay, right. Yeah. So go on, so, go on with question. Yeah, so I have uh, two questions, Professor Will Hyde, and thank you very much for this uh, pointed uh, presentation. It's very good to hear you live after reading uh, a couple of your uh, works on African, ancient African Christianity. Uh, so my first question is about the Punic uh, uh, culture in North Africa. Uh, you made the reference that uh, it's, a, uh, it, it's descended from the Phoenician. And uh, I wanted to, uh, to, to ask, so how much African was it since uh, um, Augustine refers to himself as a Punic and so forth, or are the Phoenicians um, uh, African descended people? Uh, because they, if I understand your, your comments at, at that point, uh, you seem to, suggests so that uh, Punic refers, uh, I mean, come from the Phoenician who invaded uh, North African at some point. So I'm, I'm not sure how African uh, that uh, culture is supposed to, uh, to be or to be understood. Uh, my second question is, uh, I'm fascinated by 
your scholarship and uh, the likes of uh, Tom Orden and uh, ancient African Christianity. And I'm wondering uh, if you actually make a, 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 an intentional reference to uh, the non-Christian scholarship found in the likes of Czech Anta Diop, uh, who, has, who are known as Afrocentric. Uh, is are you inspired by uh, writings like that, or are you coming to an Afrocentric uh, vision of early Christianity, independent from that, as an as an intellectual, uh, uh, independent from the Ethiopian uh, intellectual orientation? Yeah, thank you for your questions. Could, oh, just, yeah. you, could you clarify on your second question? Before you called it Afrocentric, you said there was a specific, there was a oh, name you used. Yeah, I, I, I was referring to Czech Anta Diop, uh, this uh, Senegalese uh, uh, astrophysician astrophysi who advocated for an Afrocentric uh, everything. I mean, and then Afrocentric scholars today refers to him. I mean, he is the inspirer of um, people like, uh, you know, Kwame Nkrumah, Pan-Africanism, and so forth. More of a political intellectual movement. And I was wondering if you were aware or if your scholarship is intentionally inspired by that or, or not, because the logical uh, usage of your of scholarship like yours will fit perfectly in Czech Anta Diop's, you know, the portrayal of Africa or ancient Africa. I, I was just wondering if there is a connection, uh, a scholarly connection there with what you are doing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, I I didn't catch the name, but I did understand your your larger question there. So I appreciate that. Let me start with the first part about the Punic. Okay. So this is incredibly, as you can imagine, complicated to answer. Uh, for one thing, if the Punics conquered North Africa a thousand years before the time of Christ, how long does it take before they count as Africans, right? So yes, in some ways they're a colonizing force, but even more than that, I think what probably, if you're wanting to see the Punic element as a truly African element, the way that I think you would go about it is to compare it to what happens with Roman elements. So you have indigenous Africans speaking Latin, dressing like Romans, claiming Roman citizenship, and yet they're also very much Africans. Just like I said with Paul, Paul is a Greek speaker, Roman citizen, but he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. So that I think the way I understand the Punic historians, they would talk about North Africa the same way. That, in fact, that's one of the reasons why we still differentiate Phoenician culture from Punic culture is because they bring Phoenician language and they bring some things like Phoenician gods. But when it settles into North Africa, it's African people who begin to speak the Punic language and African people who accept some of the culture and dress and in fact, in the earliest Roman writers and Greek writers, people like Herodotus actually blend them together. And they, so they would differentiate between the Punic people who came and the Berber, which is just their word for barbarian, right? Um, so we need better words than that, but I'm using their language. They would talk about the Punic Berber all in one word. They, and sometimes they would use the word Libyan, the, uh, the Punico-Libyan people, because of that kind of, as I said, the, the adoption of Punic language by African people. So I don't know that I have all the answers for you on that, but I think there is certainly a way that it is better to at least look for these kinds of elements and not just ignore them and assume these writers are strictly rat, Roman, strictly Latin. So that's what I'm trying to do there. Okay. But I appreciate you. the question. And then the second question, no, I did not know this particular uh, person who has championed this and who so many others are dependent on. But yes, I did look into several Afrocentric writings, and, and, I, I, and I, I started this as a doctoral dissertation at the University of St. Andrews, and I was interested in how to go about answering this question, right? I knew of studies of Syriac Christianity that noticed it, that, that documented the unique Syrian features, Coptic Christianity, Egyptian Christianity, Ethiopian Christianity, but I couldn't find anyone doing this for North Africa. And my doctoral supervisor had his first PhD in anthropology. 
And as a Jesuit priest who had lived in Africa, worked in Ethiopia, he was quick to, to show me the, uh, the importance of trying to come up with theory uh, to help me document the evidence without claiming any sort of, like I cannot offer an Afrocentric interpretation. So yes, I know that that body of literature is out there and I was introduced to it, but since that wasn't the area, I was gonna be able to make a contribution. I didn't actually draw from those sources. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Prof. Um, do we have any others? Yes, Dr. Walton, if I may. Okay, great, yeah. Yes, uh, Professor Lohai, thank you very much for your very fascinating presentation. Um, I'm Joshua Settles. I'm, I'm at a Kofi Cristala, but I'm also I am, I'm an American. Um, so I, I I like hearing the American accent. It's been a long time, so I'm grateful. <laughs> I started to ask you what part of the U.S. you're from, but that's for another day. I I have been interested in the ways in which you could, what we could term the Europeanization of history in, in the sense that you see North Africa co-opted as it were into the European story uh, so that Africans somehow cease to be African uh, or these sort of distinctions are, are, are created um, in a way to, to, to uh, bring the separation between Roman Africa and Africa, uh, as if they are, you know, they, they can be separated. So um, I really appreciate also your emphasis that's come through several in your answers uh, on the sort of multi-ethnic, multicultural dynamic that was at play in these in these areas. But I, back to my first point, to what would you attribute this tendency to sort of de-Africanize early African Christianity? Thank yeah, you. thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. And, and some of the points you're making there, I, uh, I can quickly say I'm from Georgia originally. I live in Texas, uh, so I, most people don't think of. I started to say I started to say Oklahoma, okay. but maybe you're yeah. you're stuck halfway between Georgia and Texas, so that's maybe why. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Most Americans think I have what they call a Southern accent, but you in Africa would not think of this as Southern, just American. So, um, thank you for asking. Uh, as for the, yeah, how did Africa get de-Africanized? That's right. The history of Africa has been of, of African Christianity in particular has been whitewashed. So throughout medieval and early, early modern history, uh, it this is not the case. I, I was pleasantly just surpri uh, pleasantly surprised to find that most of the references in sort of medieval chroniclers and uh, and, and early Enlightenment scholars, sorry, early Renaissance scholars who are still remembering and citing African Christians as for their importance, for their influence. Tertullian is remembered in all the manuscripts as Tertullianus Affair, Tertullian the African. This is true for every African writer. They, they're remembered as Africans. And then uh, one, one major point that I've identified, and I, I don't really work in modern history, but I, I've tried to look into this some because I, I'm interested in this question. Uh, when North Africa was colonized by the French, the early French scholars who came were Catholic. And so they were fully aware of the African Christian presence that was there in ancient times. And they were eager to find it. So that, that picture I showed of the uh, amphitheater in Carthage, at the very end, there's actually a shrine that's been built, a chapel on the site where the French Catholics believed they had discovered where Perpetua and Felicity died. So there's an altar in there. They were very eager to discover these saints and they thought of them as African saints. And so they were there to embrace their African saints. But unfortunately they brought with their study a very strong Eurocentric bias. And the French colonial, the, the early French historians, uh, what they say about people like Cyprian and Augustine as Africans is nothing but disparaging. The African part of them represents to the French writers, the barbaric, 
uncivilized, unenlightenment, you know, stubborn, backward kind of uh, mentality. I mean, it's it's embarrassing to read how racist the language is in these early French writers. And I can't pinpoint any one writer who challenges this, but best I can tell, there's a radical shift that happens after World War II. And I, I'm guessing that in the wake of the Holocaust, that much of Europe was sort of awakened to the problems that had um, that it had borne in its Eurocentric and racist assumptions. And so um, the, while that was a good um, recognition, the, the, the sad byproduct of that was instead of talking about these North Africans in racist terms, European scholars stopped talking about them as Africans at all. Since they didn't really know how to do this, they just tried to see them as humans and as people, which is a laudable in its intent. But then what had happened is the rest of the 20th century simply forgot that these are Africans. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Are there are there any others? Yeah, I see yes, there. Daniel yes, Cranting. Is that Daniel Cranting? Yes, please. Okay, D Daniel. Thank you very much. Uh, my uh, is uh, an observation. Uh, thanks to Dr. Gezi, uh, who led us in our early African studies. So after that, I had a conversation with a Roman Catholic scholar. And my question to him was that uh, with the Roman part, it had existed, you know, since the early African uh, times till now. We've had, you know, African popes and all that. So what happened? Is it because I'm a Presbyterian or I'm, that, you know, some of these things were so alien to me until my lecture at ACI? I don't know if uh, uh, is it Dr. David had anything you know to say on this? Because with the Roman, it's never been broken. You know, from the Roman Catholic Church, it's been the same from the early African days, and it's the same arrangement and everything. So what happened? Couldn't they at least speak to their congregants that through them, others like us who are not Roman Catholics could have gone to know that look, indeed, Africa did contribute a lot to the body of Christianity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, oh, Daniel. The so there's I think at least two two layers, probably more, but at least two layers I could address in answering your question. So the Roman Catholic Church uh, does have a clear line; they they trace back to ancient times. Now I would say it has not always been exactly the way it looks now, but that's okay. They they're accepting of their development over the years, but they do have the benefit of remembering the tradition from the earlier years. And so, as I said before, they remembered that these were Africans, that these were African saints. I think the more that the modern colonial project took on, the more tempting it was for European writers, even Catholic writers, to try to embrace these early African saints as part of the same orb, the same, the same realm as all the other Italian and Greek and other church fathers. So the more you just imagine them as belonging to us, and us, if, if you're a Roman Catholic in, in Rome, it's just easy to think of them as like us. But as I said, they remembered that they were African. I'm just not sure they had a good sense of what it meant for them to be Africans. But then the added layer that's complicated is when you have the Protestant Reformation, and even, even to today, our Protestant schools and seminaries, of which I'm Protestant, I teach in a Protestant school, we have a very tenuous relationship with tradition and history. We're supposed to teach the history, but we have a um, uncertain way of holding on to the tradition. If anything, we have a tradition of rejecting tradition. And so I don't know about your school in particular, but Presbyterians would be like many other Protestants that simply don't champion these sorts of um, ancient voices. It's too easy to take that Protestant principle of sola scriptura, which I affirm, the idea that the revelation of salvation in Jesus Christ comes solely through scripture, not through a, a bishop, not through a pope or anyone else. Well, I affirm that, but then what about all the people who actually put the Bible together, who preserved the Bible, who interpreted the Bible? I mean, so that's where we Protestants too often 
took the sort of easy step of saying, once we had our Bible canonized, then we leapfrog to Martin Luther and then start studying Protestantism. And that's all you need to know. And unfortunately, I think too many of these other voices get eclipsed when you do that. Mar Martin Luther would not have wanted that. He, he, he quoted Augustine, he read Augustine, and remembered Augustine as an African. August uh, Martin Luther rediscovered the Ethiopian church and wanted the Protestant church to look more like the Ethiopian church than the Roman church. So unfortunately, we later Protestants, I don't know if we just got lazy or got um, too caught up in other concerns that we didn't keep these things at the forefront. But as I say, I'm not sure about your experience, but that's certainly been the case in my context. Thank you, Prof. So it was part of the colonial project. Okay, any others? Yes, yeah, so there's uh, Karim. Sorry? Yeah, oh, okay, Karine. great. Um, Karine, Karine Yampon. Okay, Karine, yes, go, go ahead. Thank you very much. If your lecture has been very, very fascinating, and I think it's empowering for me. Um, so my question is, what, what are your comments on um, how we can reconcile this information to um, the perception that Christianity was brought you know, to Africa? Obviously, with this presentation, you can see the contribution Africa, you know, right from the beginning. So what would be your comments on that? Well, so it's a big question. Uh, I, I don't know that I can give an easy brief comment to that, but the notion that Christianity is foreign to Africa is simply bad history. The evidence is 100% clear. Christianity was more prevalent in Africa than it was in Europe before uh, uh, medieval times. And the idea, I mean, Christianity has continued to have a Christian presence in Africa, in places like at least Egypt and Ethiopia, if not other places, uh, since ancient times. Much like what we were saying about Roman Catholics, their unbroken line in Rome is the, the same, could be claimed in, in, in Egypt, in Ethiopia. Um, and I guess just while much of modern Christianity in Africa did come back to Africa through Western missionaries, uh, it still should be remembered that the Christianity, that the core Christian doctrines that were brought to Africa were formulated by ancient African Christians. So all the key doctrines of Trinity, incarnation, uh, ecclesiology, how church and sacraments work, how the canon itself is put together. I mean, all and this is again Tom Oden's project to show that, that all the most important voices were from Africa. So even though those African teachings of Christianity got wrapped in European clothes and then Western clothes and then came back in the Western clothing, it was still the same African teachings of ancient times. I, so I'm not sure if that's too simplistic of a way to answer your question, but that's at least where I would start in trying to address. Well, I think understand. it does it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Um, any others? Yeah, Doug. This um, Daniel, Ativo. you are back. No, this is Ativo now. Sorry. Ah, okay, Seth. Okay, you're doing this together with Daniel. Okay, Seth. Yes, uh huh. Go on. Um, just a quick one. Um, I would like to find out from Prof that considering how heavily early Christianity was Latinized in North Africa, uh, to what extent do you think that contributed to the eventual demise of Christianity, that the fact that uh, Christianity was not indigenized or localized, the fact that they spoke Latin dressed like uh, Romans and you know, different like Roma, how did that contribute to the eventual demise of Christianity in North Africa, especially when the Arabs came? Thank you. Yeah, great question. It's It's been something that's been debated for a long time because when when the Arab expansion comes into North Africa, they, they the, the Arab invaders conquer around 700 all the way across North Africa to the Atlantic. At that point, our Western Latin Christian sources fall silent. Literary sources fall silent. Um, so maybe most of you know this, but I just wanna be clear on what we're talking about. In Egypt and Ethiopia, those sources continue, although it become, Christianity becomes a minority religion. 
In North Africa, though, to say the voices fall silent is not the same thing as saying North African Christianity disappears. So we actually have evidence of North African Christianity continuing well into the 12th century. I mean, 1100s, there's some evidence all the way into the 14th century. Now it's slim. So we know Christianity has been on the decline since 700, but how quickly and how it happened is unfortunately, it's about impossible to know for sure. So in the, the last chapter of the book uh, that I wrote that Dr. Glarup mentioned, it's called Ancient African Christianity. I have a chapter that really runs through all the different theories. And there's about seven different theories as to why Christianity in North Africa does not ultimately survive as it does in Egypt and Ethiopia. And I do think that the lack of an indigenous language Bible and liturgy has got to be one of the contributing factors. Um, now there have been, I say there's other theories because if you only pointed to that, that's just, it, there's, 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 there's criticism of that as too simplistic, but I think when you add to it other factors. So I, I gave that timeline earlier about the, the different waves of sort of, of, of history. You have the Roman empire times, the Vandals come in and conquer North Africa in the 400s, and then the Byzantines come and reconquer North Africa. And then there are actually several wars between uh, different indigenous groups and Byzantines between Western um, Gothic groups in North Africa. And then there's another war when the Arabs come in. And at each one of these, there was uh, a, a waves of, of people who would flee the war and go out as exiles to live in other places in, in Europe and beyond. So I think when you put together a series of events, then you can see why when Islam comes on the scene and claims to believe in Jesus, Jesus is the most talked about prophet in the Quran, but you can't compare uh, the, what the Quran and what the new Muslims are teaching to a text on your own, right? So if the, if the local African Christians can read, which most could not in any ancient context, they have to read it in Latin, which may not be their native language. And so I do think that there was an inability to really compare the sources of their faith with the sources of this new religion. And so I do think that is a major contributing factor. Sorry, that was a little bit longer answer uh, to say, yes, I do think that's one of the major factors, but I don't think it's the only factor. Thank you, Prof. Um, we probably should have the last question. Great. And I can see Raymond IAE's hand up, because we, we are nearing uh, the time of closure. So uh, Raymond, yours will be the last, except someone has a burning question on his heart. Otherwise, Raymond, yours will be the last. Raymond. Thank you very much, Dr. Walton. And uh, thank you, Prof. Will Hyde, for your uh, presentation. Would you like to comment on the significance of studying early African Christianity and uh, its implication for current African Christianity. Thank you. Yes, I would like to come in on that. I need to acknowledge I'm not really the best voice to come in on that. I have been to North Africa, I've been to Egypt, I have not been to Sub-Saharan Africa. And so as someone who's not as familiar with the context there, um, I'm not sure that I would have any more wisdom than, than the many other people on this Zoom call. And so I want to be a little deferential there. And I guess what I could just contribute is that I teach in a school that has some international students and we have some African students who've come and uh, are very interested in this subject and in working with me to read more about ancient African sources. So I see how important it is to my students. Also, if you think in terms of the African diaspora, uh, we have a large African-American population in our city. I work with some of our black churches in town and we have several African-American students in our school. And again, this, uh, the, the, when I speak to our students and to our local Christians and people that I know around our country who are descendants of Africa, I mean, I hear one, just how important it is to be able to claim ties to ancient Christianity to the Bible itself, to early Christianity itself. And there's also voices that would wanna say the opposite, even within those communities. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with the um, 
different movements going on here, but you could go back to the, the, the Nation of Islam and even more recent sort of versions of people who are claiming that Christianity is a white man's religion and therefore Africans and people of African descent need to claim their own faith, their own uh, roots in some other way. And so for black Christians, they are very eager to find these sources and they find them very helpful and inspiring. And so I feel, see my role as a way of facilitating them. I, I am a church historian who can help with Latin texts and help find the sources, but how these are relevant, I think is a question for others to answer. And I'll just say one last word on that is I'm, I teach a class about every two years on this subject. I'm teaching one in the spring called Ancient African Christianity, and it, uh, it always fills up. So both, both students of African descent and, and students of European descent find these sources important and, and, and as I say, important in many ways, important to anyone who wants to trace their Christian faith back from biblical times to today, and especially people who can trace their own connections to the ancient faith. Thank you, Prof. But um, Dr. Gezi, would you want to comment on that one too? Easy. Yes, I'm here. Right. Mm. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, well, in, in the course we offer, we also highlight particularly uh, what we may call rural Egyptian early Christianity or early uh, rural Egyptian Christianity with the likes of Antony and the monastic life, um, emphasis on scripture, um, the, if you like, the spiritual dimension, which also links to the primary religious context um, in, in, in rural Egypt as against urban Alexandria. So I'll probably give maybe uh, a more rhetorical response in the sense that it's when the African Christian who is in touch with his own or her own African uh, Christian experience when they are introduced to the um, early African Christian experience as, as, as it comes to us through the text and also our reimagination of, of things, then it becomes something more subjective as to what you can run away with. Um, and I think as David uh, provided with the issue of the mother tongue, and I was intrigued to, I mean, hear, and I presume this is your own reflection on the comparing of texts. Um, so you hear the Quran text uh, being, being read, but you can't compare or contrast with uh, a scripture, a mother tongue scripture. Um, within you. So the issue of mother tongue Christianity also comes through and, and reinforces um, the argument that uh, Kwame Bidiakum and others have helped us appreciate about even modern Christian experience and the vital importance of, uh, or I say vital importance, but the importance of, of mother tongue, um, uh, reading the scriptures and, and working with the scriptures in the mother tongue, how it helps to kind of ground the Christian experience uh, as much as it can. Uh, so that would be my uh, two, two responses on that. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. I, I presume this has been of help, not, not only to um, Seth Atibu who has a question, but to the rest of us who don't have uh, this kind of um, information. We have to stop at this time. And I want to, on behalf of the organizers, say a very big thank you to Prof. David Wohite for your lecture. It's been insightful. And thanks for what you've given to us to take away. We hey, no, please, want... Before you go away, before you go away, could I ask how I could send my uh, manuscript to uh, Professor Wilhite? Um, What's the address to which I should address? I mean, Henry, I, I, I have your I have your email, and I will forward that to Dr. Wilhite. Exactly. Great. Thank you very much. Great, and I just put my email in the chat as well. So if you'd like okay. to email me directly, anyone okay. who has questions about these, you're welcome to do that, and you can find my address that way as well. 
Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Prof. Uh, we want to recognize um, Prof. Agilian Bidiapo, who is the spouse of uh, one of the gentlemen uh, we honor today. Um, and Mary, can, can you please? Um, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. All right. So that's um, Auntie, Auntie Mary, we call her Auntie Mary around here. That's um, Mrs. Uh, Gillian Bidiako. We recognize your presence uh, at, this, at this meeting. Thank you very much. Then we want to request the rector of Agrofacus Line Institute, who happens to be around, to give his final comments and then the closing prayer. Yeah, so a, a little bit of announcement before oh, okay. uh, Rector comes. Okay. Um, so, well, maybe also a vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, David, uh, Professor David Wilhite, for honoring our invitation and giving us food for thought, as has always been our desire when we have um, this, this lecture. Our, and Michael, if I'm not mistaken, our number today is relatively low. But um, I, I know that people will follow up on, uh, on, on, the, on YouTube and others. So thank you very much. As I mentioned earlier, we run this twice a year, um, April and then in October. April around the birthday of Andrew Walls, uh, 21st of April. And then in October, around the on or around the birthday of uh, Tom Odin, uh, which happens to be today. So we, we, we thank you. Look forward to our next um, lecture in the series, um, God willing, uh, in April 2023. And um, we, 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 we trust that we'll have a good time as well. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, very reverend Dr. Watson, over to you then. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gizzi. Um, Rector Prof. Kwashi. Thank you very much. Uh, I can only add my voice to the show of gratitude to Professor David Wilhite for his uh, fascinating presentation. I personally have learned a lot from it, and I'm sure all of us have benefited from hearing him. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who has been part of this session. Let us uh, pray to conclude our time together today. Loving Father, we are grateful to you that you continue to accompany us in everything that we do. All we need to do is to invite you to be with us. And where three or two of us are get gathered together, we are assured of your presence with us. And so thank you for being with us in this session. Thank you for opening our hearts and our minds to learn through your son, David. And uh, we commit ourselves, loving Father, into your hands that you continue to be with us and help us to remember the heritage that you have granted to us. So we'll continue to engage with this heritage, especially on this continent, and that all the gifts of the past would inform our continuing service to you. Thank you, and as we part company, may your peace go with us, and may your grace into your hands, we commit our night and the rest of the day for some of us. May your peace be with all of us, even now and always. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Amen, thank so you. Thank you all for participating. Um, the organizers, uh, Dr. Glera, Dr. Gezi, for facilitating uh, all of this. Um, and Prof. Prof. Will Height, thanks so very much. God bless you. Thank you. Bye. Good to very see much. you, Prof. Wellington. Yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Yeah. I just, I just want to let you know that David did teach at Seattle Pacific. 
that was his first uh first gig before oh. coming up the <laughs> yeah ah, uh, okay. just wanted to make that connection for you all right ah, okay <laughs> yeah thank you I was, right. about to, I was about to look you up and send you an email to say tell tell uh rob wall and dave neenhouse and other folks there i said hello <laughs> Oh, okay. I will. I will make sure I tell them. Okay, thank you. <laughs> wow, that, that I did not know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Prof. Prof. Wilbite. Yes, uh, my name also. You see, my name up there on the screen is Kripu. That, that's my. That's my Ghanaian or African name, but my full name is James Kripu Chechi Walton. Now, if I shorten that, it comes to James K. Walton. And you would oh, think right. that I'm a Westerner, but I'm full-blooded Ghanaian. So that, that should <laughs> help help with your thesis. I, I'm exactly. and Latinized. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, 